Welcome back everyone. I'm Yana and it is the month of May and I have 11 books to talk about this month. I began the month reading Alice Neal, People Come First, published by The Met, which came out in April. It's the book for the exhibition, which I really wish I could have gone to in person since the paintings look so textural and the colors are interesting. I wish I could see the ochre tones in person and the contrast between the thin washes and thick textural layers of paint. I wasn't at all familiar with Alice Neal before this, and I have to say that this was the best reading experience with an art book I've ever had. Learned a lot about her, every figure was relevant to the text, and the plates were all in good order to go back and forth between essay and example. The People Come First title comes from Neil's mission statement, which she's emphasized throughout her career, saying, I have tried to assert the dignity and eternal importance of the human being. When portraits are good art, they reflect the culture, the time, and many other things. They show the spirit of the age. There's an icebreaker type question that's like, where would you like to travel to because you read about it in a book? My answer is unequivocally New York City in the mid to late 20th century, particularly in Greenwich Village, where people like Alice Neal were living and working. She was an American communist and lived right by the NAACP headquarters and often participated in civil rights protests. A lot of her portrait subjects are her neighbors in Harlem and then the Upper West Side, mostly people of color, of lower income, queer, Basically, people not designated as mainstream and quote-unquote fine art, to which Neil said via both paint and words, fuck that, people come first. Next, I read Goodbye Again, Essays, Reflections, Illustrations by Johnny Sun, which came out last month as well. I basically try to finish my pre-ordered books ASAP this month. I'm trying to be better about my habit of pre-ordering books to support individual artists and then forgetting to actually read them in a timely manner. I saw Mary H.K. Choi promote this book on her Instagram, and I spent all of last year falling in love with her books, so at this point, I do what she says. This was so sweet, cute, even though most of the short essays were on topics such as anxiety and burnout. He has a lovely take on why our Asian parents only patronize Asian restaurants and the millennial generation's equivalent of hip restaurants and their Instagram accounts. Overall, it's very hopeful, trying to find as many pieces of life and joy as possible. Because I was so enchanted by and in the mood for more charming Asian stories in small bites, I read Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto, which came out in 1988. I heard about this from Claire at Claire Loves Books. Thanks, Claire. This is so earnest, comforting, domestic. Between this and goodbye again, I feel like I'm not being full Asian because of my lack of houseplants. This also made me crave katsudon. Although I was raised with love, I was always lonely. Someday, without fail, everyone will disappear, scattered into the blackness of time. I've always lived with that knowledge rooted in my being. The next book I read was World Travel and a Reverent Guide by Anthony Bourdain and Laurie Wooliver, which came out last month. To be honest, I only read it because I found it at Costco, and I was pulled in by the fact that it's a new Anthony Bourdain book and this beautifully illustrated cover. This is like a travel dictionary since it's alphabetized of all the countries that he's been to with travel tips, location lists, lots of great illustrations which serve as a reminder of his patronage of the arts and snippets of witty things he said about the places. He describes Toronto as Soviet chic, crypto fascist Bauhaus. This book is definitely nice to have for any avid fan, but also definitely not a necessity either. Nevertheless, I'm glad to have it. So then, I read End of Men by Christina Sweeney Baird, which came out last month as well. I saw it at my local Barnes & Noble while out on a date with my husband and recalled Charlotte of Charid's liking it, so I picked it up and eagerly dove in, and I did not like it. I mean, the premise is so intriguing. Pandemic plot, except this virus kills only men with some men being immune and women are carriers, something like only 10% of the world's male population survives. That obviously allows women to rise to positions of higher power, creates a new social order, and what does that kind of world look like? 
Well, I have no clue from reading this because the author is mainly interested in how the new post-apocalyptic world will date find love. There was a blip of a mention of peace in the Middle East, China being figured out into multi-states, but most of the pages are devoted to figuring out repopulation and everyday white UK people's lives and personal dramas. It was like reading Contagion the movie because it was chapters following a lot of individuals and their perspective of life during this world-changing event. Characters ranging from a sociologist, an ER doctor, a virologist, a nanny, a government bureaucrat, a reporter, but everyone sounds laughably like the same person, with the same level of intelligence and mentality and maturity, and they all behave essentially as emotional reactions. There is no science or medicine involved, and this is not meant to be a smart logical thought experiment whatsoever. It's an easy read that feels manipulative, even though it says at the end that the author wrote this pre-COVID very disappointing. Made me a bit, a bit irate upon finishing. So I followed that up with Little Joy, Selected Stories by Cecilia Pavone, which came out last month as well. As you can see, I heavily annotated this book. I found this so lovely and interesting. It reminded me, and please forgive me for this analogy, but of Sex and the City's Charlotte York, who can seem simplistic, but prove to be lovely and poignant with these thoughts and observations. There is an ode to how much she loves her house. I have a theory that these happy moments gradually build up unseen on the walls, forming a kind of sediment of love that transforms spaces and elevates them. Beautiful. And then I read your book by Seth Rogen, which came out this month. I initially debated reading it or not because although I'm all about celebrity memoirs, I really prefer them to be kind of heavy on the contemplative side. I am a fan and have seen most of his stuff, but what ultimately pushed me to read it was his real persona, quote unquote, as seen in his interviews and political, social political stories about him that have been floating around on the internet the past several years. This memoir is a compilation of his Hollywood anecdotes, and there are a lot of good ones, all of which made me laugh out loud. But having said that, my biggest takeaway is that the adage, never meet your heroes, is true. He comes across as quite a normal, relatable, practical guy whose luck and stick to have got him to where he is, and he's just nice enough to share. The ending is quite abrupt. Next, I read An Apprentice Ship or The Book of Pleasures by Clarice Lispector, which first came out in 1968, but it's been republished last month with this spiffy cover, and I've been seeing the cool, intelligent people reading it this month, so therefore I decided to read it as well. Other than the fact that it was incredibly jarring coming from the mind of Seth Rogen to now Clarice Lispector, the format of the book was that much more discombobulating but effective to get into the headspace of this torrid romantic femininity. Very sensual, full of beautiful passages. She was drinking her coffee and thinking without words, my god, and to say that the night is full and that I'm full of the thick night that is dripping with the perfume of sweet almonds. With me, you'll speak your whole soul, even in silence. Because I was so impressed, I read her Daydream and Drunkenness of a Young Lady, which was written in 1960, which I already had in the Penguin Modern box set. And if this had been my first experience of Les Spectre, I probably wouldn't have continued reading her work. There are faint glimmerings of her motifs and beautiful writing, but very different from Apprenticeship. I wasn't impressed. And then I got my second COVID vaccine and took a fun, light, comforting read for the wait, which was none other than Agatha Christie, The Man in the Brown Suit from 1924, and it was very fun indeed. There's actually a man who says the lines, let me pass, please, I'm a medical man, in Speck's body, dead as a doornail, nothing to be done. So fun. And Bedingfield and her narration is a delight. Mothballs ice cream sodas, wasps, sarcastic women, very young men, cockroaches, and superior shop assistants. Since that was so fun, and I had a hair appointment a few days after, I took with me The Mysterious Mr. Quinn from 1930, and this was not as fun. And to be honest, I wish I took with me something more intelligent, but it is what it is. This is a collection of Harley Quinn and Satterwaith stories that are all quite short, lightly interesting, and the reading equivalent of idly popping chips in your mouth as you watch TV. So those are the 11 books I have to share with you this month. 
Clearly, I got kind of caught up chasing that new new, which is quite unusual of me. I'm actually currently starting the Elena Ferrante Neapolitan series for the first time. And yes, I'm super excited for myself and have read books one and two so far, which puts me at the grand total of 13 books again this month. I'll probably do a separate video for the Elena Ferrantes, and I have quite a few short trips planned for the next several weeks, so I'm pretty sure June will be less packed reading-wise. Hope your reading months are going well. Thanks for watching. Bye!